you, Peter. Uh, I need to start by acknowledging we're on the lands of the Yagara and Torbal people. Um, like Peter said, um, Mark said, I'm a Gungaloo person from central Queensland. Um, everyone would know Warrabinda. That's my, where my mother's. That's our country, Gungaloo country, but my grandfather walked over to Warrabinda from Old Turum Mission in 1926. I think he was one of the original pioneers. So um, I, I'd just like to say to the local people, um, thank you for allowing me to be here. My story is a little bit different to June's. Um, we started, my predecessor in his last report, social justice report, um, uh, Tom Kalmer talked about justice reinvestment, a concept out of the US where states started to look at the issue of incarceration and how much it was costing. It was very uh, unusual that it was the Republican states that thought, uh, you know, generally very hard on law and order, but they were also economists and they said this is just costing us too much money to do this. And um, to be very brief, they ended up... Um, um, deciding to divert money out of the justice system and use it in diversionary programs. So they talk about million dollar blocks. So these blocks of cities where it's cost millions to incarcerate people, and they started looking at different ways of investing the money. And it's a first, like if they needed programs around early childhood, if they need programs around drug and alcohol, um, misuse, if they needed programs around employment, they needed education, boosting education, they did it. And for the first time in places like Texas and Mississippi, particularly Texas, I think it's the first time in about 100 years we've seen popula prison population starting to drop. So Tom wrote about this and, and of course I came into this job straight after his report was launched and took it up as because, you know, I don't want to talk too long about the over-incarceration of our mob, uh, except to say, um, you know, two years ago, or three years ago, was the 20th anniversary of the handing down of the Royal Commission in, uh, into Aboriginal deaths and custody, and given that we probably have probably um, um, uh, you know, almost 100% more people in jail than it was then, uh, by any measure, you'd have to say the implementation of that report is an abject failure. Um, so we started thinking about this and then we worked out very quickly it's going to be different in Australia because Texas and particularly Texas and Mississippi and Illinois got to the point where they were going to build a prison and decided to take Texas's case, take $400 million out of that and invest it in community. Now we're finding very hard for a government, a state government in this country to do that. And we had to rethink how justice reinvestment would work in Australia. So there's a group in, in um, the coalition in, in uh, New South Wales about uh, working with justice reinvestment. Mainly the Aboriginal Legal Service um, uh, and the Commission working together with a whole lot of other partners, but mainly us two working together about how we do this. We started knocking on doors in, in Parliament House and, and we got the shuffle, you know, it's not our problem in Aboriginal affairs, it's not our problem in, in justice, if I go to child protection because we want to cover all this stuff, child, don't talk to us about it, you know, it's their problem over there, it's a justice issue. And we worked out fairly quickly we weren't going to get anywhere and, and we came up with this idea about a community driven approach to justice reinvestment in this country. And we put the feelers out. And, and we said we wouldn't go into a community unless we were invited. And Burke, at that stage, there was a lot of really bad publicity around Burke. I think one newspaper report said it was the most criminal town in the world, given the incarceration out in that place. So they asked us to come out. Now, what we're doing in reality is peeling back about 30 years of of the way we've worked. And I've been involved in a lot of that stuff as a bureaucrat, so I put a couple of conditions on it, my involvement. And the first one was, if the first thing we start talking about is a plan, I'm gonna kill someone. 
And the second condition was, if we start talking about a new committee, I'll probably kill myself. <laughs> so we're really freelancing at the moment. And so what we started to do was to talk to people. And, and it became very apparent that... Um, and we, 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 we talked to the council, we talked to Aboriginal people, we talked to non-Aboriginal people, we talked to service providers, we talked to the police, we talked to the schools. And, and the same message came across, you know, we think there's a lack of respect in this town, we think um, it's fairly racist, there's things that are happening. Um, the schools aren't working for us. Um, and, and most of all, we feel unsafe. And, and they were fairly almost traumatised by these media reports all the time about how bad that town was. So we just started talking. And it's amazing how many people would, when they... Uh, oh, the condition I said of my, of my involvement, I said, I've got long-term commitment to you guys out here. I'll probably keep on working with Burke when I finish this job. But my involvement depends on an invitation to, from you for every meeting. So my involvement is from meeting to meeting, but my commitment's long term. And I did that because I wanted them to be in control of this. The community has to be in control of even my involvement. So we started talking, and, and it's amazing the number of people who started presenting me with submissions for funding. Now, as I said outside to a couple of people, we're the brokest agency in the Commonwealth. And once I said we got no money, the conversation changed. Well, what are you doing out here? We want to talk about justice reinvestment and reducing incarceration rates and, and, and you know, just making the place a bit better for you guys. To tell us what you want to do. So it took about 12 months of meetings, of just sitting down talking to people. We had to build respect. We had to make rules about coming to a meeting, leaving your hats at the, at the door, whether you're a police officer, whether you're, you work for child protection. Um, you've got to leave everything at the door because you're not here to defend your agency, nor are you here to be attacked. So well, we built confidence of people coming to these meetings. And then, because we, we decided to do it a little bit different, we, what we're going to do in Burke, the overall plan in Burke is... Um, um, we're going to work out how much it costs to incarcerate people from Burke. Now, we, we got initial figures of about $2.5 million a year to incarcerate people between the ages of 16 and 24. Now, that's a very conservative figure because we haven't built in police time and court time. This is just pure cost of the prison system. So what we want to do with government, and we've sort of got agreement, so there's a couple of us who work with the government in Sydney, but the Burke people run everything out of Burke, is to say, if we can reduce incarceration rates by, say, 10%, and we all agree that's a figure, will the government invest 10% of the figure we agree incarceration costs back into Burke as free money? The Burke community can decide how they want to spend it. So that's how we've been working on this. Now, it's taken them a while. You know, leadership takes a while to build, and this is what we want. To, you know, what the aim is out of Burke that the community's got to run this. So we started off with about five people. The last meeting I went to, about sixty people turned up. And you've got to fight government on this because. Uh, just before I went to the last meeting, the, I met with the minister, Victor Domanello, Domanello, and he said, Mick, you've been working out there for 18 months, but nothing's happened. And I said, oh, you mean we haven't asked for any money? He said, yeah. I said, well, that doesn't mean nothing's happening. And so what's happening is the community's starting to build their capacity, and they've got to be in control. And the, the stuff June talked about is exactly the same. There's all these multiple agencies. You know, we've, we've got five mental health providers in Burke all fighting over the same bodies. We've got, you know, there's 130 houses allocated for Aboriginal people. We've got four housing providers. There's duplication of services. There's things like, um, you know, methadone. Drugs are a really big problem out there because of the highway people coming 
in and out of the place with, through that highway park bringing drugs out. But you can't get methadone at the local hospital. You know, people want to get off drugs, I've got to leave Burke. And I said, bugger it, we'll just keep climbing in windows, stealing things and buying drugs. So we've got to talk to government about the levers they can pull. But underlying all this is the community. I keep on going back to the community. And my, it's, it's really hard for someone like me. And now this might be counterintuitive to what you see around Aboriginal stuff, but I don't think we've actually let Aboriginal communities fail. Because every time they look like failing, we've all got to intervene. And Burke people do things I wouldn't agree with. And the hardest thing for me, and it's going to be the hardest thing for service providers, is actually let them go and do that. Because my job is to support them. And they've got to learn through failure. See, we, you know, like I say, it might be counterintuitive for us to talk about not letting our communities fail, but we haven't because the intervention might have failed and so for everything else has failed, but we, we've got to do that intervention thing. So it's really hard for us to work from Sydney to say that's a good idea. A couple of really key points that you need. You need local leaders. And we decided we'd scout around Australia to find the person who can actually do this stuff. Someone with the skills. I've tried a whole lot of different models in my time of place-based leadership. And, and unless we get those things right, the leaders, the people who do this generally become kings and queens of black, so they go out there and lord it over people, or become totally captive, or, or you know, generally lose perspective. But we were really lucky because there's a fellow out there, Alistair Ferguson, who's just brilliant, an Aboriginal fellow, and he, I love Alistair. He's the key to this, because he can float between the council, the schools, Aboriginal community, the service providers, he's so respected out there that he was there already. And all of a sudden we've got these young women coming out of the woodwork because they're being listened to. We've got... A, uh, and what we've decided to do to go to philanthropics, that's why Victor was saying to me we're not getting any money out of it because the community decided they didn't want to go to government for this. So we went to philanthropics and again, they tried something unusual. You know, when the philanthropists came and talked to us, Alistair and Mick Williams, who's an Aboriginal sergeant out there in the police, said, we don't want your money yet. We want to know that you're committed to what we're committed to. So if you just want to give us money and tell us what to do, we don't want you. So they actually were in control, and, and it sort of messes with people's minds when you say you don't want money, trust me. <laughs> so... But we, the, the philanthropics came out, a couple of them. We've got money for Alistair to be released from his day job. Um, the police have released Mick for 12, uh, two years, I think. So we, we're doing this without any money, any new money coming in. And we know... We want them... And we're going to talk shortly about um, collective impact. Oh, trust me, I get a bit wary about these new buzz things. Um, I've collective impact, I've done program budgeting, you know, I've done all this stuff. I, I just think that we've got to, fit, you know, we're not going to fit into collective impact model. The model's going to have to work for us. And we're going to have a bit of a discussion about that in a minute. But where we got to, though, at the last meeting, after two years of talking, or well, nearly two years of talking, we decided to talk about a plan. But we didn't start with a plan. The first thing we're going to do after all this is to have an amnesty on outstanding warrants. Now, people have got to come and actually um, be, have to be accountable for the original crime, but before, because the warrants are issued, we're going to have an amnesty. We, we're getting close to negotiating this. So what that means is the police, the community, the Aboriginal Legal Service and the magistrates are going to sit down and talk and we've, we're negotiating how this is going to work. So the police aren't going to... People will come forward, we hope. Police won't lock them up while they're waiting to go to court. There'll be special sittings of the courts who's going to decide where we go. So that's the first thing they decided to do. It was around justice... It was around incarceration, 
So that's the first thing. Guess what started to happen next? They said, well, we can't just fix this bit up and throw people back on the street. So we've got to get them jobs. We've got to get them back into the school system. Now, what are the barriers to that? Then they started talking about barriers, you know, no jobs. You know, there's, I don't know why there's no jobs out there because, you know, there's 90 to 100 backpackers out there in seasonal, doing seasonal work, but local Aboriginal people don't seem to get a go. So I've got to work with the employers out there, the farmers, the council. Hardly anyone works, Aboriginal people work on the council. You know what the councils are like in these places. So all of a sudden, this plan started to emerge. We're going to end up with a plan. Though Alistair was very wary of raising that with me. Mick, I know you hate plans, but we're going to... Have... I said, we know we've got to have one. But this is a really organic system. It's, it's a, the plan is organic because it's growing out of the people. And the amazing things that are starting to happen now, because people are comfortable talking with each other. This one meeting we had, we talked about the amnesty and the police came on side. Um, but they had this, this joint team of people who look at child abuse. And all of a sudden, the community felt comfortable enough to say, we've got to do something about child abuse. It was their time to raise it. They felt comfortable about it. And the police and the docs workers who make up this team said, this is the first time in Burke we've ever had this conversation. And all of a sudden, people went away in a corner. The women, the men, the police and the docs people started working out immediately how they want to do child protection in this town. Because it's not about government taking control because the people who are going to benefit from this is our community, so they wanted to be in control. So these things are just starting to emerge, but it all comes from the community being in the driver's seat. Now, they've had Nigel Scullion out there. He played, they played with his mind as well when they said, we don't want any money. But what they want from Nigel and what they want from Victor is this. We want to work out how much money comes into Burke for Aboriginal things. Now, I, I, I said outside to some people, we're going to be gobsmacked when we find that out. You don't think much money, but if you cost out, like a town the, normal, a town the size of Burke will normally have about 12 police officers, there's 54 in Burke. One of my mates, when I told him that, said it must be the safest community in Australia. I said, well, it ain't. Yeah, 54 coppers must be really safe. Well, it ain't. There's 30 dock workers out there. They all generally come from outside the community, so there's n even the white people don't get employed out there in these things. How much does that cost? How much does it cost to house them, to give them cars, to pay them? So we're going to work all this out, and when we, in both the Commonwealth and State, and then we're going to get the community to answer two questions. And the first question I think we know the answer to, and that is, do you think you get value for this money? Does Burke community get value for the money being spent? We think the answer is going to be no. And the next question is, if you could change the spending, what would you spend the existing money on? So they're not asking for new money. What they want to do is be in control of what is already going into that town. And lucky enough, the Shire Council wants to do the same thing. So there's this great relationship now starting, first time ever it's starting to emerge between the Aboriginal community and the council. So I think I'm, I'm really excited by this, it, it, but, it, but it costs. And I said to some people, the main cost is something we can't create because there's only ever going to be 24 hours in every day and it takes time. And I remember working in WA, I'll finish on this, because it's really important. And I, I, was, I, I got given about, I didn't get given, I had to manage about $10 million on, for two communities. And we started going to this first community, and after about 18 or 12 months, the minister rang me and said, um, Mick, you're not spending any money out there. And I said, well... No one ever really treated this community, the community leadership with respect before, I'd say, because 
they were struggling with how to make decisions. So we're building their capacity to get into this. And his answer was, well, that's really nice, but I'm taking a journal up there next week and you can't photograph someone's capacity being built. <laughs> and to me, that says it all. And if we're going to spend money, we've got to spend money on building capacity. And this is not just Aboriginal communities, because I can tell you that non-Indigenous communities watching this, and they want to be part of it because they're saying, we're sick of government coming, telling us what we're going to get. The last thing I'll tell you is, I had to ring in this community, we had some guy out there do some work, and I said, you know that bit of land that's near the office over that side? And he said, yeah, I said, can you sort of go and plough it in the shape of an oval? He said, well, and I said, that's going to be our football field. So we got the minister, his photo of the new football field at Jigalong. <laughs> and he was happy and he kept off my back for another 12 months. <laughs> it works. Thank you.